continually in my ear and in my heart and its very essence. But what I want you to hear this morning, what I want you to see, what I want you to have in your, in your mind, is I want you to look within these situations for that which confronts you where you are. We put a lid on our Christianity. Um, and it's it. Everyone has their lid in a different place, but we still put a lid. And that lid, what we say is, okay, this is what God wants, and this is this is what I. I may not be there, but but I know what God wants, and and uh, but but we don't really realize what God's after. So what we've done is we we've, we've said, okay, this is this is my plateau, and we and we put a lid on our relationship to God. And I want us to take the lid off. I want us to rise above our religion, uh, be moved above our faith, moved from faith to faith. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter in the fourth verse, it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let what is said today be heard, spoken and heard, not in the wisdom of men, but in manifestation of your spirit and in the power of God, that our faith could be founded, not upon wisdom of men, but upon that power. Oh Lord, let it be so. Let it be so. Let us be so that if we move, God, if we only move one step, let it be in and towards you. In Jesus Christ, amen. This speaks, Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in manifestation of the Spirit and the power of God, which tells me, Paul is speaking of that your, our preaching can be either way. Our preaching, and I'm not talking about necessarily a pulpit. I'm talking about our ministry in our lives. Can, can, our preaching can be with the enticing words of man's wisdom. Or it can be in the spirit, demonstration of spirit and, and power. The difference is that... In one, in the, in the enticing words of man's wisdom, it's us taking God and doing something with Him. It's us taking our religion to the world. It's us taking. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, it's when God truly has us and takes man to present Himself to the world. It's the difference whether we take God or God takes man. And that is the difference in religion and faith. I want us to see God's purpose. I want us to, to understand what it looks like. I want us to, to know what it, what it looks like in the spiritual realm according to to scripture and God's purpose and, and prophetic, uh, prophetic announcement. And I want us to see what it looks like when it comes forth in truth in the kingdom that is of the earth. I want to see the condition that God's purpose can only exist where man is filled and placed where God has in, eternally wants him to be. And I want us to see the condition that exists when that filling and placement fails to take place in our individual lives. And I want us to see that the, that the difference is that that determined the fall of Adam and the state of the church today. It's that, that placement, that filling and placement. If you will allow me once again to read to you Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed Man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord to grow, to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Man is formed of the dust of the ground, receives the breath of God, put in a garden that God planted. This ground, this place, this condition is the creation of holy ground. It is any time in the scriptures that you hear holy ground, it is because this has taken place. It can take place no other way. It is the creation of holy ground and always when holy ground is created, immediately a river will come out of Eden or from God and it will flow in and this holy ground, filling it and then flowing it to uh, flowing out to the world. What we read in Genesis 2, we know that in Genesis 3, the next chapter, man fails, man falls, he's cast out and the garden, the flow no longer can fill the garden and it's suspended to the earth. What actually takes place in the fall? What is it that actually goes wrong and that must be replaced? We must understand. Through the loss of the tributary of holy ground that is man himself, the life of God no longer flows uh, into the garden or out to the world. So what, what constituted the great change in Adam? In the, in, in the fall, what happens to Adam is the flow in changes, and if the inflow changes, the outflow must change. Any time that the in, in your life, I will tell you what whatever is occupying you coming in is that which will flow out, and and it, it is there that we determine whether we will demonstrate spirit and power, or where, whether we will demonstrate where we'll fall back using the things of God, but only in the wisdom of men. Because the anointing of God is not there. Because the anointing of God has not been flowing in. The t the, what took place in, in Adam uh, was, uh, uh, what the great change in Adam was he now, because of the change of inflow, Adam is now no, no longer able to love God. He's no longer able to trust God or to believe God. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 it says, But it is written, I have not seen, ear heard, neither it has entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them that love it. In the 14th verse it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What took place in Adam in Genesis 2.17, God told him, Of this tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This is a dying to the fellowship with eternal life. It happens to us. It happens to us throughout our life when, when, when we get over into self. It is a dying to to uh, the fellowship of eternal life and, and the loss of the spirit that he had received to know the things of God. We know that, that it says in second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Adam died to that spirit. So he cannot know the things that are freely given to him. He cannot know the things of God. Luke 10, 22 says, All things are delivered to me of my Father, Jesus speaking. No man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, on who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Adam now, because he's died to that fellowship of eternal life, has no ability to have revelation of the things of God. Now, because they cannot enter him, they cannot flow from him. And he has come to this place that this has stopped the flow in the tributary of holy ground. Now, what happens to him is exactly what happened to the church. And it's exactly what's going on in your life right now. Because through the loss of fellowship of the life of God... He's shut off from the heavenly kingdom. In that plan of creation, the kingdom of earth was to be connected and filled 
and maintained by the kingdom of heaven. That was in, in God's creation. What he showed us in Genesis is he said, okay, it's here the two kingdoms are connected. And by this connection, the kingdom of heaven is going to flow into the kingdom of earth. And the, and the kingdom of heaven in its eternal uh, will, will, will keep the earth eternal in its, temp in its temporality. You understand what I'm saying? That which is temporal is kept eternal by that flow. So that is the connection. That's why Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. That connection is to be there. Now the flow of that of that eternal in is through a keeps a divine fellow an eternal life fellowship and the divine order of God and the truth found in the kingdom of heaven governed the kingdom of earth. That was the plan. But when Adam fell, now he's unable to receive the heavenly flow and it creates uh, the condition and the inability to no longer love, no longer trust, no longer believe, no longer truly worship God. From this place, then he must seek alternative answers to the things that, that in God's plan were meant to be supplied by heaven. Man must turn to the kingdom of earth to supply alternative answers that God intended to be supplied to this kingdom by the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Everything, the prom every promise of God that's in that Bible that you can read, that God says, this I will do, that we are looking to the world for, is the things that, that we become separated from in the fall of, of man. Genesis 3, 7 said, And the eyes of them both were opened, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now they sow, it, the, the important thing I want you to see in that now, is it said, and they sowed. Man saw his need, and man sowed fig leaves. Now, the issue that I want understood is it said, they sowed. They sought to supply what was needed in the relationship with God. This is when men substituted the wisdom of man for the manifestation of the spirit and power. This is what we do in the church every, all the time. We substitute our wisdom for the things that we've lost because of the loss of fellowship with the life of God. And it's only the very tip top of, uh, of the condition because everything in this life is determined by our relationship with God as the determining factor. Everything because the kingdom was intended to flow into this kingdom. And we filled it with so many things that we want to give God praise for. Man now turns to the earthly realm and moves away from the heavenly realm and, and, and moves to the things of earth, away from the things of God. And the result is man knows God. I mean, see what he did here. They sowed fig leaves. They still know God. They still have the same, the, the same mentality. I want to worship. They still say, okay, God's still supreme. But no longer is this relationship flowing in. So they're now sowing. They're, they're doing their own sowing. Man knows God. Still knows God. Still seeks God. But it's a very limited fashion through a, a homogenization of that kingdom and this kingdom. I know God and I allow God in this area of my life, but I put a lid on my religion and upon my relationship and it doesn't really look completely like this, but that's okay. It's a, a homogenization of this kingdom and that kingdom. Was that what God intended? What are we going to do about it? 
What, are you, what am I going to do about it in my life? We end up with a doctrine of heaven, but an earthen reality. We proclaim a truth, and, and yes sir, every word of it's true, but we live a life that doesn't allow it all in us, and in us. And does not come to the place, and, and, and I'm not condemning us for where we are. What I'm saying is look beyond where you are. There is the great breakdown. There is the failure. There is what needs to be fixed. It's not that I'm telling you, okay, throw away your medicine. I'm not saying to you it's wrong to look to earth and technology. I'm saying to you it's time that we understood there's more than this. There's a higher level that God intends and it's time we look to Him and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? We don't even question the fact that we live, proclaim a doctrine that we do not live. And we don't even contest that. Because we put a lid on our religion and, 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 and we think, well, this is where I want to reach and it's not as high as God wants to take you. Praise the Lord. The purpose of God, know this, the purpose of God is to, it, it, it is from the time that Adam fell, was to bring man back to the place that Adam was created to occupy. And that place that he speaks of is his rest. It's his rest. He said to us in Hebrews, the third chapter, but with, in the 17th verse, but with whom was he grieved? 40 years. Now, I want you to understand, this was the church. And I want you to hear this with, with a heart and a mind that said, where am I? Where are we? Where are we? Who was he grieved with for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? That means they never reached the promises. Who was he grieved with? A church that never reached the promises. It was to those to whom he swore that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see they could not enter because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear. Let us therefore fear. Lest the promise being left us as of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world for he spake in a certain place saying the seventh day on this wise and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works they failed to enter because of unbelief and you know I've read that many times and, and maybe it occurs to you as you hear it how can God hold me accountable for what I believe how can God hold anybody accountable for what for what they believe? Because, you know, believing is, is not something that you can just say, okay, I'll just, I'll just believe this. Or it's not something that you can just say, well, I won't believe this. Believing comes from a deeper place than that. It comes from a deeper place, whether it be in the natural or be in the spiritual. So how is it then that, that God can hold us accountable? Because unbelief, is not from a lack of information. Unbelief is not from a lack of, 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 of persuasion. Unbelief is a separation from he who can believe. 
There's only one that can believe God. It's God. And it, my unbelief, uh, uh, Adam's unbelief in, uh, that took place in the garden was because he was separated from life that can believe God. And unbelief is, is the separation from he who can believe. It's the separation from the key who can receive. In Hebrews eleven six, it says, without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Restoration, unbelief is a, is a product of separation from that life who can believe. Therefore, restoration is an acquiring, not an acquiring of information, but a reunion with that life. But a reunion with that life. Unbelief is the breaking of a fellowship. And that's why all unbelief is sin. Because it shows where that fellowship is, is, is not restored. Now, we must recognize the difference in belief and being persuaded. Because what the church has done is it's taken, it said, let's take the word of God and persuade. Or let's go out and take the word of God and, 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 and debate with those people that don't see it our way and try to persuade them. And then we call that faith. But that's all contained in the natural realm. Belief and persuasion are two different things. Belief is that which is awakened and quickened in you that is eternal. It is that in Hebrews 6 that said that they, uh, they believe that God is. It's that awakening of that life that says He is. Jesus said, if anybody's going to enter the kingdom of heaven, they must enter it as a little child. Now, I want you to consider what he's saying. And I'm going to give you a, 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 uh, um, a parable, shall we say. When my kids were little, I would say to them, Today I'm going to take you to the store, and you can buy you a toy. Now, my kids... Then I, I would go to them and, and I would say, this is what we're going to do. Now, if you go and ask my kids, what's going to happen? They would say, we are going to the store and we're going to get a toy and be brought back here and we're going to play with our toy. What makes you believe that? Because my daddy said so. My kids would not say, Here's what's going to happen. My father's going to come. He's going to put us in the car. He's going to get in and turn a key. An electronic spark is going to ignite a gas fume, causing an explosion. And the continuation of those explosions will turn a drive shaft and, and then turn an axle. And by that, project that car continually down the road where he, by guiding with a steering wheel, will take it in the right, navigate and bring us to the store where we will go in, get our toy, and and then we will take her and come out and he will reverse all of that and bring us back here. We will get out and we will play with our toy. They would not say that because they're not persuaded. I didn't persuade them as to how this will work. I just went to them and I said, this is what we're going to do. And their whole confidence was not in how it's going to happen because this is all beyond their world. The entirety of their confidence is based in the fact of their relationship with who told them. And when daddy said, I'm going to take you to town and get you a toy, the entirety of their belief was because my daddy said he would do it. That is the belief that God wants you to have. Not to know how it will work, because it's beyond your world. It's the, the belief that begins the process 
Jackson that God is talking about is founded right there. He just said, what I want you to do, and without this it's impossible to please me, is just believe that Daddy is. Now, if I, and the, the next thing that we have to do to, to, to reach God's purpose in our life, okay, first, I've got to believe that Daddy is. And that what He says, He's going to do. He's going to do. I don't, the, my child did not drive the car. He just rode and got what he was told he would get. But the next thing that we have to understand is what is it that God is telling us? What is it that God wants you to know? When I told the kids, we're going to go to whatever store and get you a toy, they knew what to fasten that hope on. My daddy is going to take me to that store and get me that toy and that's what's going to happen. Where is the store and what is the toy that God's talking about? What is it that he's trying to, that we must recognize what it is that God is taking us to? Now, in Hebrews, they could not believe because they did not mix the word with the faith. Now that, again, we understand that, that that's 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 God. Now, when I took the child, only thing responsible for that that child had to do was was to do what I said. The only thing that 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 my son or daughter had to do was when I said, get in the car, they got in the car. That's all that God's saying. Now, what is it that God is taking us to? What is it that God is wanting us to identify and to know, okay, this is what Father wants, wants me to have. This is what Father wants me to have. God is trying to bring you to the place that you understand the entirety of His purpose is to put you in that place that Adam was created to occupy. He wants you to understand and see that what I'm going to do, child, is I am going to bring you into that place, that filling and that placement that will bring forth everything I intend in your life. You don't have to do Grace will take care of all of it. The only thing that's necessary for you to know is when I tell you to get in the car, get in the car. Just obey what I tell you to do. What Adam could no longer believe because of the loss of fellowship, we are yet able to believe because the fellowship is not yet restored. We have not yet restored that fellowship because we've not come to that place that we understand what Daddy's talking about. Where Daddy's taking us and what it is that He's wanting us to do. What, what, what is His get in the car command? Now, where this res restoration meets with, with that not yet restored is where the spiritual meets the natural. And it's where we find our mixture of and our, and, and our individual faith. It says that they could not believe. Understand, or they did not believe. Understand that, it, that belief, we've made belief a lot less than what it really is. We've made belief, I believe in this word. I believe in its every promise. But what, but what a man truly believes is what he does. What you truly believe is what is what drives you. It becomes your life. It becomes your habit. It is the alternative you turn to in time of need. What you truly believe is found right there. For God to change that, we must understand and fully understand this is what God promises that we are using a substitute to supply. 
and he's wanting us to understand that is where I'm wanting to take you. That is where I want to take a lid off of your religion. When Adam, in the fall, the life of Adam was totally changed from that, from that kingdom, from a nativity to that kingdom, to this kingdom. It all changes because of what he believes. The only hope of restoration in changing how I live is to change what I believe. Adam is incapable of making the change himself and so are you. And so am I. I am totally incapable of making the change as to what I believe. And that's what God wants you to understand. I'm not, God said, I'm not asking you to believe what you can't. I'm just asking you to begin with believing in death. And I, if you will do that, and if I can get you to understand that and just get in the car when I tell you to, I will change what you believe. Because only God can change what we believe. Only He can believe God. So it is a matter then of restoration. Uh, 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 okay, God, here I am. I know that you want to take me. I, I know now that you want to take me to this place. And, and so I'm now listening to you. What is it that you want me to do? What is your command? Speak to me. Let me know how where to put the next step. Now, I hopefully I'm not completely losing you in the catacombs. What God did in holding Israel and in, in Hebrews responsible for what they believe is because God said to them just exactly what I'm saying to you. God wants to put you where Adam was. He wants to put you where life can fulfill you and flow through you. And every promise of God is in there. It's, it comes out of that. Here's what God told Israel. I'm going to take you to the promised land. Didn't he? He told them, that's where I'm going. That's where you're going. Know where you're going. That way you can know when you get there and you can know when you're not there. He said to them, okay, who was it that fell? Those who agreed because they, they never got there. So he says to them, I'm taking you into the promised land. That's, that, that's where you're going. And this is how God could hold them responsible. They knew what God intended for them. They knew what God's purpose was for them. Now, God told them, as He tells us, this is a place furnished from, from before the foundation of the world. It is the place that Adam was put. He was filled and placed. Now what we must do is have revelation that God is seeking to bring us back to that place. That Adam was filled and placed and put in. And that place is the rest of God. And it is holy ground. That's what God is trying to take and always intended for the church to do. It is not possible for you any more than it was possible. I want you to picture in your mind the day after Adam is cast out of the garden, the flaming sword and the cherubim are put there guarding the way into uh, back into the garden. And it's totally impossible for Adam to go in. It's totally impossible for Adam to enter in where God intended for him to occupy. And the same is true for you as we sit here this morning. The ability to enter that place is no more possible for you right now than it was for Adam that next day. But the only difference is that God is saying, Now I am come that you might enter, just as he did with Israel. And he said, This is the promised land that made them responsible. You are now know this is your promised land to be in that place. He wants... He wants us free of the curse of the fall and the reality that's always dictated and is dictated by a dominant earthly kingdom in your life. As long as the earthly kingdom is dominant in your life, you'll be under the curse because that's what it is. That's where it is. How many understand what I'm saying? 
That is that which God wants to set you free. Now, Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That God, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. If God does not give you that spirit, you cannot know. It does not come any other way than if God gives you that spirit. You can read this and know it back to front and quote it and intellectually, uh, intellectually be the most uh, astute uh, Bible authority in the world. But if God doesn't give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, you cannot believe. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what is the riches of His glory, of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. Our need is not information. But a person, our need is the spirit of wisdom and revelation to open the eyes of our understanding that we might know it is to come alive to the spirit and to hear the spirit when he gives us the next command, get in the car child. And then God can bring us he said in the 21st chapter of Matthew to the church of that day, He said, you will not repent so you might believe. What He's talking about and where our, where our difficulty is, is that old natural man that is that kingdom earth dominant. We've got to repent of Him every step of the way because it's Him that's blocking you from, from the next step. And it's always an amount of, my God, it's me in my own way. I, I am holding you back. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is not something that by signing a piece of paper or joining a church or shaking a preacher's hand. It's because what's happened is we've allowed that life to quicken that is able to believe God. And the next step is to say, my God, you must increase and I must decrease. And show me what it is that you want me to do. When was the last time we approached God knowing where he wanted us and asking us, what is it that you want me to do in my life right now to do? To, to, to load up in the car that's going. It speaks of the mighty power of God working within the exceeding great power to those who believe. We first must come to the understanding, okay, this is what you're wanting to take me to. He's wanting to take us to a place where we're manifesting the spirit and the power of God. He's wanting to take us to a place where the promises of God are alive and well and have filled this garden that, 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 that it can flow to the world. That the world will never know a God that's not, that, that's, that's not as great as the church. We can never present a God to the world that's greater than the God that's in me. But we put a lid on God and what we've allowed Him to be within ourselves. And that has put a lid on God to the world. And we proclaim a doctrine that we don't even prove with our own life. And we're not even confronted by that issue.
It said it. And I'm going to quit. Because I don't want to go into it. I'll, I'll do that next time. But I want you to understand it. It said that this power that works in you is wrought. Is wrought. In Christ. Which was wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the, from the dead. And set him in his own right hand. In heavenly places. This power was wrought. In, and what that was. Is that was the ability of you and I. To go back in. To that place that Adam. Where Adam was filled and placed to be. It's within our grasp today because it was wrought in Christ. And it was wrought in Christ in the fullness of his experience. It's like I told you last week. What would have happened had he lived and not died? Or had he died and not rose? Or had he rose and not ascended? It's in the fullness of the experience of Christ. But now, it, Jesus said, I am the way. John 14, 6. What was he talking about? He was saying, I am the way in the sense that in the fullness of my experience, I made the road. And in the fullness of my experience, now becoming your experience, you can travel that road. No other, not lesser, but that experience. I must give this life in submission to Him. That is, that is to live and to die unto Him. Then there must be the resurrection of Jesus Christ bringing up a life in me that's not of me. Then there must be an ascension into the very heavenlies. And then only by that is He on the throne in my life. The fullness of that experience in you and I that is wrought in Christ is that which God is going to go. That's the ride. That's the ride to the store. And that's what he's saying to you. It is that I will address. That's where I will take you. That's the road. That's the way. The same experience now, it must take place in your life and it involves involves the fullness of the Trinity of God. But what God, if, if you've heard nothing else that I say to you, here's what I want to say to you this morning. God is saying, I want you to know where it is that I want to take you. I want you from this moment to know you can be satisfied with no less than that the power of God would flow through you in the life of God. Jesus said in John 14, 12, he said, greater works than these shall you do because I ascend or go to my father. What's he talking about? He's saying, because of my full experience of and what I, what Brent is brought out of that, you will do greater works works in these. That's what God wants you to understand. That's the place that He intends the church to set. Now and through eternity that the power and life of God could fill all things through you and I. And it will never be greater out there than it is in there. It fills the garden and then to the world. So what I'm saying to you is know that God wants to take you higher. He wants to bring you to a place where you set Him with Him in heavenly places. He wants to bring you to the place of the office of the Son of Man. He wants to bring you where the world can know God through a church that walks with Him. He wants to bring you to a place where we're no longer presenting the wisdom of men, but we are presenting the spirit and the manifestation of the power of God. He wants to bring you there. And the road on which He will take is the full experience of the Trinity, which Christ come and experienced and said, I am the way. It is there that God wants us to understand. You know, understand this as never before. God is showing me. He's showing me and opening me up to it. It's all Him. Everything that I've tried to do, it's all of no, no avail. It's of no value. It's just like that. My, my children, when they, when they were just, I told them this is what we're going to do. 
All they had to do, it was greater than their world. All they had to do was just, when I told them to get in the car, get in. That's all what God wants us to understand. Grace supplies every portion. All He asks us to do is give ourselves fully. And that means, in the very most maybe what we would consider to be the most insignificant things that God will whisper in your ear and he'll say don't or do that's what he's saying to you get in the car and if you'll do that you'll believe him more tomorrow than you were able to believe him today and this will take you farther and farther on that road and in that experience and bring you to that place that He intends. And it will be no more you today, that day, than it is today. It will be Him. And it's His plan. He doesn't, He's not going to make one up. It's been His plan. It's been that rest that was furnished from before the foundation of the world, it's in that calling on your life that was yours in Christ before the world began. If we'll just give ourselves today to Father's voice, we'll find the rest of it that's beyond our world will come into grasp. But we must believe that He is. the Lord. And that he's going to speak. And that his purpose is to take you beyond where you are. And to glorify himself in you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope I'm not presented something to you that is as some mystery or some riddle. If I have, I've failed you. For what I've intended is to present something very simple. All of its complexities belong to God and they shall always belong to God. The simplicity belongs to you and I. Just let God do what He's always intended. And not one word of His good promises will fail or fall to the ground. But they'll all be realized in you if you are yielded to His voice.